Let's take scripture and read those verses once more. Speaking of Joseph and Mary, scripture says, after three days they found him, that is Jesus, in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. After the word of God is being proclaimed, let us respond unto the Lord, singing from Psalm 119, the stanzas 13 and 14. Brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you think about it, we actually do not know very much at all about the youth, the growing up years of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Of course, we do know quite a bit about his birth, all the circumstances, all the events that surrounded his very special, unique birth. These are the things that we hear about and remember at this time of the year. Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, the wise men, the star, the manger. But what about after that? As Jesus was a toddler and then a child and then a teenager, what about that time in his life? We do know from Scripture the time when he was a number of weeks old and his parents brought him for the ceremony of purification to the temple. We read just the end of that, Simeon and Anna. And then, of course, we have this account that we read together about what happened when Jesus was 12 years old and went for the Passover feast in Jerusalem. But beyond that, we don't have much more at all. And it almost leaves you a little bit curious. Who hasn't wondered? What was it like for Jesus growing up in the family of Joseph and Mary because they also had other children? What was it like for Mary and Joseph raising their family, including Jesus, the sinless child? Certainly we've all wondered about these things. We've been curious about them. And so were Christians in the early church. In fact, so curious were they that it started to spill over and there were various stories, not true stories, more like myths or fables, but they were circulating, they were even written out and circulated in the early church. Let me allow, allow me to make you briefly aware of two of them. One of the stories that was circulating at that time was when Jesus apparently was three years old. And his mother Mary was walking with the three-year-old toddler Jesus down the road and there was a fruit tree on the side of the road. And Mary expressed her desire for one of the fruits that was on the tree. And so the story, the myth, the fable goes that little Jesus gave the command and the tree just bent over miraculously and Mother Mary could grab the fruit that she was desirous of. There was also another story that circulated in the early church about Jesus when he was five years old. And apparently he was making from clay the children today would probably call it Play-Doh. He was making from a clay the, the figure of a bird. And once he had made a bird out of clay, out of Play-Doh, he gave a command and miraculously it turned into a real bird and flew off. Now you can imagine how in the early church people were interested, especially the children, thought these were fantastic stories. But there was one big problem. They weren't true. They didn't come from the Bible. They came up from people's curiosity. 
But the question for us, brothers and sisters, is not what might fill our curiosity, but what has the Holy Spirit revealed to us? And that's what we have here. This one extensive account of Jesus when he was 12 years old. And what the Holy Spirit reveals here is in the first place, not, brothers and sisters, to satisfy a little bit of our curiosity, because one account at 12 years old would hardly satisfy our curiosity, but this is given for us and our salvation, as we confess in the Nicene Creed. This is not just a story about a boy who lived in Nazareth and traveled to Jerusalem. This, brothers and sisters, is our mediator. This is our deliverer. This is Jesus Christ. And I may proclaim then the gospel this afternoon in this way, Jesus in his youth, a student, but also, and so importantly so, our Savior. We'll focus on three things. First of all, how he was sitting among the teachers, and he did that for us and our salvation. Then how he was learning from those teachers, again for us and for our salvation. And then finally, how he astonished the teachers and others beyond that, again, for us and our salvation. Congregation of the Lord, you could hardly be blamed if, on hearing that theme, Jesus in his youth, a student and our Savior, you pondered a little bit and wondered perhaps about that word student. Of course, we know what students are. We have some children here. We have children watching online as well and participating, I assume. And children at a certain age become students. Of course, they're learning from early on. But at a certain point, we say, oh, now they're a student in elementary school or in high school. And once they're a little bit older, perhaps they become a student at college or university. And when you are in that stage of your life, when you're called a student, then one of the main things in your daily activity is starting with listening. You do a lot of listening to the people who are teaching you. And then, if you're wise about it, you ask questions, especially if you don't understand, then you need to ask the question so that you understand better. And not only asking questions, but as a student, you're going to spend a lot of time answering questions. Bible worksheets, English worksheets, math worksheets, and as you grow up, essays and tests and even exams. It's a whole lot of listening, asking, and answering. That fills your day in so many different ways. And what's the point of being a student? That you grow that you grow in knowledge and in that special skill and ability of wisdom, not just knowing things, but carefully discerning things. Well, if that's what it is to be a student, does that apply to this special, holy, completely unique person, Jesus Christ? Christ. Jesus is true God and true man. God knows everything. And so the question is perfectly understandable. How does this apply to Jesus Christ, who is true God and true man? Would he actually grow and increase in knowledge and understanding. And from the start, we must confess, there are things here that we simply do not fully understand. There are things that go beyond our comprehension here. At the same time, we can, indeed we must, say what the Scriptures say. And this afternoon, I draw your attention to three connected details in this passage. The first comes in 
Verse 43, when the feast was ended of Passover, and as they were returning, the boy, Jesus, stayed behind in Jerusalem. You see, it's as if the Holy Spirit puts an underline there. Don't forget, this person, Jesus, here at this stage in his life, is a boy. Not a man, a boy, 12 years old, to be precise. And this boy, Jesus, is growing in wisdom and understanding. That's clear from the two other verses to which I would like to draw your attention. The first is verse 40. And the child grew and became strong, being filled with wisdom. What does that mean? Does that mean that Jesus, as he was growing up, became wiser and wiser, filled up with wisdom? Well, yes, because that's verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom, and he increased in stature, and he increased in favor with God and man. And so on the one hand, we confess him to be God, but that does not take anything away, brothers and sisters, from the fact that he was a real flesh and blood human being who started as a baby and went through all the different phases and stages of growing up in his human nature just like you and I and every child does. Yet, without sin, we come back to that in a moment. But it was very real for our Lord. He did not take some type of a big detour around the growing up years. He went through it, just like all the rest of us. And when we stop to think about that for just a moment, there's very, very good news tucked inside of that. Because when we take a moment to reflect on our own childhood, our own youth, our own growing up years, we realize it's just not all smooth. That's not reality. Going from infant to toddler, from toddler to child, from child to teenager, up to young man, young woman, on into adulthood, that whole progression, that's not like a big jumbo jet, like a 747 taking off on a smooth, windless day and just rising up higher and higher to 37,000 feet or whatever they fly at. That's not the way it is growing up. Climbing up through the years, that's bumpy. It's turbulent. There are ups and there are downs, and there are days that are just so difficult, so emotional, and then there are days that are brighter and things go smoother. And if you're a child right now, if you're 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, you're going through that. And you know that, you experience that, all of the ups and the downs and the bumps. But if you're gathered for worship and you're an adult now, and you look at those years in the rearview mirror, maybe even if you have to stretch back and think for a while, but you know that it wasn't any different for you. You didn't just sail from infant to adult. There's a lot of history there. And it's not all smooth by any stretch of the imagination. And that's why when we sang Psalm 25 together, that phrase, my sins of youth, really resonates very, very realistically. Also that we sing it in the plural, not just sin. It wasn't that, oh, there in childhood I made a mistake or two along the way. 
all my growing up years, if I'm honest, and you notice my, I'm not just talking general, my youth, my years of growing up are filled with this sin and that sin. I said something that was hurtful. I said something that was disrespectful. I was supposed to do that, and I went off right in the other direction, and I did the opposite thing. I was at times rebellious. We sang it together again. My rebellion. Oh, sure, there's other people that are rebellious. That's not the point. My rebellion. My transgression. These are the things that fill up the days of my youth. But they didn't fill the youth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it wasn't that he skipped over it. He went through every phase, every stage, every challenge, every growing up temptation. It was all there. And he came through it sinlessly. Why? So that he, as your Savior, might also cover over all your personal sins of youth. When we're a child, sometimes when we're honest, and maybe when you pray before you go to sleep at night, on certain days you feel really badly because that wasn't a good day. But you know, children, teenagers, it actually becomes stronger when you become older and you become an adult, and then you look back You look back at the things that you did and that you didn't do when you should have done them. You look back at the things that you did and said and you say, that was so foolish. And some of those things, they're hard to step beyond. And even though you know, we sang it, there's forgiveness. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is merciful. But still, it still pains the conscience. How could I I've done that. There are stories about our youth that we don't want to share with children or grandchildren. But God knows. And God in Jesus Christ, who went through his youthful years, forgives. That's part of the gospel that comes from Jesus in his youth. But it gets fuller, it gets richer. Because this 12-year-old Jesus is sitting, says the Holy Spirit, among a certain group of people there in the temple. Teachers. That means people who were very, very educated, particularly in the Scriptures, particularly in all the ceremonies and all the laws. These were rabbis. Today, we would probably say they're the PhDs. They're the Bible scholars. And there is 12-year-old Jesus, still a boy, almost teenager, but still a boy, as the Holy Spirit says. And around him, let's just say it that way, are all these PhDs. And you say, that's it. That's actually a very peculiar, that's that's an unexpected sight. Twelve-year-olds usually want to be somewhere else. But you know what's really peculiar, what's almost divinely ironic here, is that this twelve-year-old boy, who is Jesus Christ, who is also fully God, he is the one who through the Holy Spirit has inspired the source book that all of those teachers, all of those scholars spent so many hours poring over and trying to understand. 1 Peter 1 verse 11, you can easily remember it, it's all ones. 1 Peter 1 verse 11 says that the Spirit of Christ inspired all of the law and the prophets And so here's the irony. It's really those teachers, those PhDs, who should be sitting and listening and learning 
from the one who is the author. The author of the scriptures is in their midst. They don't see it. They don't realize it. And the boy Jesus does not show it off in any way. He sits in humility and he learns from them. Here is the humility of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And why does he humble himself in this way? So that he might fill us. He might lavish us, is the word of Ephesians chapter 1. There is a knowledge that is given, not through the PhDs that are around, but there is a knowledge that comes through he who was the 12-year-old boy that puts to shame whatever brilliant minds, whatever intellectuals, whatever philosophers, whatever great thinkers about religion may be in, there, in, in this world, brothers and sisters. When we today, yes, when the six and the eight and the ten and the twelve-year-old children in this congregation, Guelph Emmanuel, when they have received instruction through the Spirit of Christ, let me say it very plainly, those children are wiser by far, than some of the most brilliant minds with the, with the biggest number of letters and academic degrees behind their name. They understand what the human condition is. They understand what the Savior is, who He is, what salvation is. They understand what this whole world and life is going towards everlasting life. The eight-year-old instructed with the wisdom of the Spirit of Christ knows more about the truth than so many other teachers in this world. And yet, Jesus Christ was willing to listen and to learn. This is how he is described in that sitting posture, listening to those teachers and asking them questions because that's how you learn. Children have to start by listening. They have no other choice because when they're really, really young, they can't speak. And so the one-year-old going up towards two years old, they spend their days listening, listening, listening to all the people talking around them, all the words, and then they learn. And one day there it all comes. The words, the phrases, the sentences, and before you know it, they're talking. And they're asking questions. Mom, what's that? Dad, how does that work? And then, of course, why, 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 why? They want to know why about everything. They go from listening to asking questions to the point where dad and mom are so tired of answering all those why questions that in a moment of frustration, they just say, because. No more why questions. But that changes, doesn't it? Because when a child is 12, not 2, there's a different approach. And the 12-year-old is not always so keen about listening. And the 12-year-old, for whatever all reasons, and it is different from person to person, of course, but whether it's awkwardness or worrying what friends are going to think, but 12-year-olds don't always so intently ask questions like they do when they're younger. But this is the 12-year-old, Jesus Christ. And he is sitting there listening with big elephant ears, as we sometimes say. He is there asking question upon question upon question, so keen, so intent on learning. You might say, he's the picture-perfect student, but also our Savior. Again, whether you're growing up now or whether you look at that in the rearview mirror, 
how many times, whether it's as your parents were talking to you, the family room, family devotions around the table, or perhaps when you grew up a little bit and you were in the catechism class and the minister or the elder was explaining things, or you were in a Bible class or a Bible study. But in our growing up years, we have had so many blessed opportunities to learn more and more and more about God and salvation and the Scriptures. And guess what? We squandered a lot of them. We weren't paying attention. We weren't so keen. We were hardly listening. We didn't ask the questions. And so that golden moment to increase in wisdom and understanding slipped by. How many parents haven't said, I wish I would have paid a bit more attention when my own parents were teaching me something? How many office bearers haven't said, I wish I had paid more attention in catechism class because now that I need to be sharp on what Scripture teaches, I'm a little bit fuzzy on that point. If we look back, we ought to have a lot of regrets because God gave us opportunities not just parents, not just teachers, not just minister. God gave us opportunities to learn and grow. And we were distracted or fooling around. That too was part of the sins of our youth. But not the 12-year-old Jesus. By natural inclination, it would have been Run off with the cousins, run off with the friends, the other 11, 12, 13-year-olds, and go along the road back to Nazareth. In fact, that's exactly what his parents thought he would be doing. That was the normal. That was the natural. But the Lord Jesus Christ stayed there. He wanted more and more time to listen, to ask questions, to learn. So keen was he also to learn about what he would have to do, what he would have to fulfill as he grew up into his task as our Lord and our Savior. But he was keenly learning there for us and our salvation so that we may know that all the opportunities that we wasted and squandered, and there are a lot, that too is covered. That's forgiven covered in the perfect learning attitude of Jesus Christ, the student who was also our Savior. And the people there were amazed. They were translated literally, they were flabbergasted. Their jaw dropped. They were so stunned. Why? The Holy Spirit says, at his understanding, but also the way he spoke, the way he answered things, because that's all part of being a student too. You need to give the answers. And this is what the people who heard him were just so agog about. How does this 12-year-old boy answer in that way? And what was it, we wonder, that left them so astonished? Well, using Scripture to understand Scripture, brothers and sisters, once Jesus Christ grew up, and once he began to preach and teach from town to village to town to village, the people were astonished. Same word then as well. Matthew chapter 7, verse 28. When Jesus finished saying these things that we now call the Sermon on the Mount, the crowds then too were astonished 
at his teaching. Why? For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Because that's how the rabbis taught. They gained their authority by quoting other rabbis. You read these writings, brothers and sisters, I can tell you, it's rabbi so-and-so who quoted rabbi so-and-so, and it's human authority, it's human ideas, it's human opinion. And the idea was of the rabbis was, if you stack enough of these smart human beings up in all your quotations and all of your citations, you can convince the crowds. It was authority through multiplying human opinion, and Jesus did not teach that way. He had an authority that was different. And there was something in his answers all the way when he was still 12 years old. Maybe they couldn't exactly articulate it, but they knew there's something different about the way that this boy speaks and answers. Why? Because he was also God. And when God speaks, that's a different voice. There may be all kinds of ideas, all kinds of opinions, all kinds of arguments, and if you stack up all the experts, it could, from a certain angle, be quite impressive. But it's not like the voice of God. And this 12-year-old boy, Jesus, is not 12-year-old anymore. That's the thing about growing up. You do, in due time, grow up. And the student became the teacher. He was not among the teachers anymore. He was the teacher, but he was not a teacher like all the other teachers in Israel. He was the chief prophet and teacher who taught with his own divine authority, that authority which cuts through all the human ideas and opinions and puts it right there. This is the truth. Period. And this is our chief prophet and teacher now. And when we gather and when we are instructed, we may be in our elderly years, we may be the child who is six, eight, ten. When we are gathered in a worship service, when we are gathered in other contexts around the word, then that same voice that so left the crowds flabbergasted, is the voice that's still coming through. And it's so clear. When the Lord Jesus Christ speaks, if he cites, if he quotes, he just quotes from the Old Testament. And if he's going to explain some truth unto eternal salvation, he picks a parable, a story about a vine or a mustard seed or a lady looking for some lost coins. It's so simple. It's so clear. It's not layer upon layer upon layer. It's right there. It's the truth. And an eight-year-old can understand it, and an 80-year-old can understand it. And yet it's so profound. It rises above. No, it's a totally different category than all the other teachings and theories. And this now is our chief prophet and teacher. Brothers and sisters, what a savior, what a teacher. Please do not ever stop inclining your ear to him. He's the one who shows the way. Amen.